Good morning, Chandler. It's a beautiful Sunday. It is good to see you all here. Feels a little bit like summer still, so that's good news for those who like the hot weather. And Well, we're not going to think about Christmas yet, but uh, we are taking special offering today for the Murray County Christmas Project. So even though we still are enjoying the tail end of summer, there's still a lot of work to do to prepare for winter and Christmas. So uh, our special offering today will be going for the Murray County Christmas Project. Uh, another announcement is that we are celebrating Nell Derenfeld turning 102 later this week. So please send her a card uh, wishing her a happy birthday and let her know that we are still thinking about her and praying about her and we still love her very much here in Chandler. And a note from the consistory, in the back we have new bylaws. Over this past year, the consistory has been working to create new bylaws to reflect uh, the change that our church made to go from the RCA to the ARC. So please grab a copy, review those. At our November congregational meeting, we'll have a vote to accept the bylaws. So does do you good to go and review what those bylaws are and what we'll be voting on. And with that, brothers and sisters, receive God's call to worship. To God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the world, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of, of blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Brothers and sisters, as God has called us into his house today, let us prepare our hearts and minds with the reading of Psalm 146. Psalm 146, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. So brothers and sisters, we join with all those generations of God's people in praising the Lord. We join me in singing number 325, verses 1 and 2.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, may the peace of Christ be with you all. As God has welcomed you here today, please turn to your neighbor and welcome them. Good morning, Mary. <laughs> well, good morning. <laughs> Our profession of faith comes from Lord's Day 16 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Why did Christ have to suffer death? Why was he buried? Since Christ had died for us, why do we still have to die? What further benefit do we receive from Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross? So that the evil desires of the flesh may no longer rule us, but that instead we may offer ourselves as a sacrifice of gratitude to him. Brothers and sisters, since we are dead to sin and we are alive in Christ, hear God's will for our lives. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Brothers and sisters, the word of God to our lives should be the most precious thing that we have. It should be the first thing that the world sees when they look to us. But how often do we fall short? Instead of testifying to Jesus, we live out our own lives. But praise be to God that Jesus accepts us and forgives us. So you join me in a prayer of confession. O Lord Jesus, as long as I am apart from you, I am self satisfied, because I have no standard by which to measure my lowly estate. But when I come near to you, O Lord, there for the first time I see myself. In your light I behold my darkness. In your purity I behold my corruption. My very confession of sin is the fruit of holiness. O Jesus Christ, let me gaze upon you one more time until the vision of your brightness becomes my sight. O oh Lord, I, I hate my impurity and my falsehood. May your glory, Lord, burn away my sin so that we, I may be perfect in your sight. And coming to be perfect, I may enjoy the presence of yourself, your spirit, and your holy church. Come, Lord Jesus, for I am fallen, blinded, and broken. So rise me again, O oh Lord, to be a new man. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace. And all God's children say, Amen.
is a hymn of thanks and praise. You can join me singing number 478, Have You Any Room in Jesus? At this time, I invite our deacons to come forward and lead us in the giving of our gifts. Shall we bow in reverence to our God? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the gift and privileges that you've bestowed on us that we may meet with you and enjoy you. We ask that you would bless this offering that we are about to collect and ask the guidance that it might be used for your glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
And just as we bring our gifts to the Lord, let us bring our prayers to him as well. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you, Lord, that you have created this world and you've given us a place in your world. I thank you that you've given us life that we can share with each other and that you have given us eternal life that we can share with you. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll pour out your spirit upon us here in Chandler and upon all your people in the world today. Give us faith, hope, and love. Strengthen our walk, Lord, so that when the world sees us, they will see you. For I confess, Lord Jesus, that this world is full of violence and chaos. In a word, it is a mess. But I thank you that you are faithful and that you do not abandon this world to darkness, but you shine your light, banishing the darkness and healing what is broken, healing what is sick. So God, I pray that we will be your hands and your feet, that we will be good witnesses to Jesus Christ, and that with our daily walk, we might help heal others and point them to the comfort that comes from Jesus. So we pray for our town, Lord. I pray that you will bless those who, who are working here. I pray that as the farmers start bringing in the harvest, it will be a blessed harvest, a fruitful harvest. They will provide all the food and needs that we need for the coming year. And as the school year starts, Lord, I pray that you'll give teachers the patience and the wisdom to teach our kids. And will you open up the minds of our children so that they may learn all that they need to know to be wise and knowledgeable adults. And also at this time of year, Lord, we know that the cough and cold will soon be going around. I pray that you'll give us protection from those illnesses. And when we do get sick, Lord, I pray that you give us comfort and healing so that we may get over them quickly. I also pray for our nation, Lord God, as we think about another school shooting that happened, as we think about all the vitriol that this election cycle is creating. Lord, I, I confess that our nation is sick. We are sick in our hearts and in our minds, and we don't know what we do with our bodies. For this nation, Lord, has turned its back on you in many ways. But I thank you, God, that you still have a faithful remnant, and I pray that you will use us to spread the news of Jesus so that our nation will turn to you. Will we not turn to drugs and violence and trying to get our own way in politics, but may we turn to Lord Jesus Christ, who is our way and our truth and the source of all our freedoms. So, Lord Jesus, send your spirit into our nation. Turn our hearts back to you. Open up our eyes and our ears so that our nation will, will hear your will and do it. And we pray also for our world, Lord. Bring an end to all this violence and chaos, all these wars, these bitter wars that we see in Israel and Ukraine and all over the world. Lord, wherever one man hates another, will you bring peace? Wherever a daughter turns to her, against her mother-in-law, Lord, will you bring peace? When people are turning to drugs and foolish ideologies, Lord, will you bring your peace? For only the name of Jesus can bring healing. And so, God, I pray that you'll be with those people who stand to protect the weak and the innocent. I pray that you'll be with our firefighters and our police officers, be with the men and women in our military, be with the paramedics who are often the first to respond to an emergency. Will you give them the strength they need to do good work in this world? Protect them. But we look forward to the day when Jesus returns and such work is no longer necessary. But until that day comes, we continue to build up your church, Lord God. So we thank you for our missionaries. We thank you for the Bruxworts and all the other missionaries who go out into the world. And as we look to them, may we follow their example. May we also be missionaries to our own communities to the many strangers even in our corner of Minnesota who have not yet heard the name of Jesus. May our testimony bring your kingdom, both now and forevermore, we pray. Amen. Let us conclude our time of prayer by singing our dixology. <clears throat>
be seated. This time I invite our children to come forward. Well, good morning, kids. Do you think it's a good idea to be boastful and proud? <laughs> no, that's a trick question. We all know that. But you know what? We all get proud of the things that we're able to do. For example, I tied my shoes today. Are you proud of me? Isn't that pretty cool? Huh? Yeah, are you pretty impressed that I could tie my shoes? To I don't, well, Parker, you don't have any sh shoelaces, so you must be very proud that I could tie my own shoelaces. Well, no, of course not. That's silly. Now, of course, when we're little, little kids and we have to learn how to tie our shoes, that is a big achievement that we're proud of. And for those little kids, you should be proud of it. But as we grow and mature, well, we face new challenges in life. And as we, well, as we say, get our driver's license or graduate from high school or college, or maybe you learn how to weld or how to drive a tractor. There's so many things in this world that we get to learn to do, and we should be happy and proud that we get to learn how to do them. But no matter how good we get, you know, we always make mistakes, don't we? And we often feel guilty and ashamed when we make mistakes. But there is one thing that we can be proud of and be boastful about, is that Jesus Christ is making us perfect. So when we look to the end of our lives, we might be afraid of death. But Jesus uses our death to make us perfect. And we can step into eternal life perfect with him and with all the people that we love. Now that is something to be boastful about. Don't you think so? I think so. Well, but I'm in no hurry. I am glad that I'm living here in Chandler with all of you and with all of you. So let's be thankful that life that we have by giving our blessing. Are you ready? All right. The Lord be with you. Thank you, children. You may go to Sunday school. Oh, of course, can't forget the most important thing. <laughs> All right, just grab one and move on. There you go. <laughs> Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 27, verses 32 through, 30, 32 through 66. But first, let us pray the Spirit may illumine our reading. Holy Father, Holy Son, and Holy Ghost, Holy Three in One, I thank you, Lord God, that you do not abandon us to our sin and our misery. You do not leave us alone in the grave, but you sent your Son to live the perfect life, to be the atoning lamb of God that takes away our sin. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you conquered sin, Satan, and the grave, and that you bring us into eternal life in God's kingdom. So, Lord Jesus, as we read about your crucifixion, I pray that this sad story may encourage us. May it open our eyes to the perfection that awaits us, so that we may live more faithful, more bold, and more brave and strong, more faithful, lives today. Fill us with your spirit, we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. 
He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate, Sir, they said, we remembered that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. This is the word of the Lord. Now about two years ago, Charles III was crowned King of England. And considering that it was 70 years since the last coronation, the nation of England went all out to make this a special event. There was a lot of pomp and circumstance, a lot of ceremony, and lots of fancy clothes. It was a big deal. But despite all that, the position of King of England doesn't actually come with a lot of power. Now contrast that with the President of the United States. That position has a lot of power, but the inauguration isn't that big an event. I mean, it happens once every four years, and most of the people there are wearing black kind of like a funeral. It's just not a big deal compared to a coronation. But if you're like the average American, you probably don't care about either of those ceremonies, or at the very least, you did not watch them on television. Now, as Americans, we tend to be more concerned about what's happening in our local communities. For example, on any given Sunday, about 100 million Americans can be found in their local church. This is much bigger than the 10 10 million Americans that decide to watch the coronation. And in most communities, the local sheriff has a lot more respect than the President of the United States. And it's kind of easy to see why. Even a bad sheriff tends to do more good for the local community than the President. And so the sheriff tends to be more respected. He gets more done. But wouldn't it be nice if there was someone who could get things done, like a local sheriff who had the power of a president and had the prestige of a king? Well, such a person exists, and his name is Jesus. Jesus has more power than any president. He can do more good than all the sheriffs in the world, and he's certainly more honorable than any king. Indeed, Jesus has all the power, and nothing can stop him from doing good. 
Not, there is no power in heaven or on earth or even beneath the earth that can stop Jesus from doing the good things he intends to do for us. But to better understand that, let us take another look at Matthew chapter 27. Now this chapter is well, one of the darkest chapters in the Bible. It is not a pleasant one to read, the crucifixion. But it is the heart of our Christian faith, the testimony that Jesus died well, before we can say that Jesus rose again from the dead, we must first proclaim that he died. This is a true fact, a true historical fact. It had to happen in order for the victory of Jesus to be complete. Before he could send up to heaven, he first had to come down to earth. Before he can rise again from the grave, why well, he must first go down into it. And so even though this sad, sad chapter in the Bible actually is the bedrock of Jesus is the bedrock of our faith, and this story should give us the hope and the encouragement we need to face the trials and troubles of our world. Now, this chapter is full of irony. There's going to be a lot of irony from beginning to end. For example, we read about Peter, often called Simon Peter, and he made a big boast that he was going to be with Jesus until the very end. But Simon Peter wasn't there. It had to be a different Simon that helped Jesus carry his cross to the end. Jesus asked his disciples to sit and watch with him, but those disciples fled him. Instead, it's going to be Roman soldiers who sit and watch with Jesus. Jesus is king of the Jews. He is the son of God. This message will be proclaimed by both Pilate and the chief priests, but they do so in a mocking way. But what the world uses for mockery, Jesus takes and uses for victory. Now, nothing Jesus does was not announced. He, for, he proclaimed everything that he was going to do beforehand. Indeed, it was written about him centuries, even thousands of years before he came. We read about many of these prophecies from the prophets and also from the Psalms. There are many psalms that are considered messianic psalms, prophetic psalms that paint the story of the life of Jesus. And when you go and read these psalms, like say Psalm 34, and you read about the Messiah eating gall and drinking vinegar, and then we look to the chapter of the crucifixion, and we see it being played out word for word. But these psalms give us hope. For even though we see this crucifixion and we're filled with sadness and despair, these psalms let us know what's going to happen in the end, kind of taking a sneak peek at the end of the book, if you will. Well, for example, Psalm 69 proclaims that the Messiah will suffer, but it ends with this praise, let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and all that move in them, for God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah. Then people will settle there and possess it. The children of his servants will inherit it, and those who love his name will dwell there. Even though we see much destruction in the world, we see much destruction in the crucifixion. Later on, the, those same Roman soldiers are going to tear down the city of Jerusalem. But God has warned us that this will happen. But in the end, God will fix it, will put it back together. And those who praise God will enter into his kingdom. Psalm 23 is another messianic psalm. And if you read that psalm, it is the exact picture of what we read about in, in Matthew 27. When Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is the first line of Psalm 23. Now any first century Jew hearing Jesus say those words will immediately think about that psalm. In much the same way that I could say, Jesus loves me, and you start thinking about this, that song. Or I could say, John 3, 16, and you start thinking about that verse. So when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those who have studied the Psalms will immediately think of Psalm 23. And the picture in Psalm 23 is exactly what we see happening around Jesus. A lifted up Messiah, a suffering servant, his enemies around him, mocking him casting lots for his clothes, piercing his side, but not a bone of his body will be broken. But this is how that psalm ends. 
All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. It is done, is the cry of Jesus that we read about in the other gospel accounts. Matthew is saying the same thing. With the crucifixion, the work of the law is done. The work of putting an end to sin, an end to death, of bringing people into God's kingdom is done. And we see Psalm 23 being fulfilled in that very moment. The centurion sees Jesus dying on the cross. He sees the effects of what happened, and he cries out, certainly this is the Son of God. That fulfilled the prophecy of Psalm 23. And guess what? We are still fulfilling Psalm 23 today. Generation after generation is being told about Jesus, and generation after generation continues to worship God because he has done it. So let's take a closer look at Matthew 27 and see more of how the death of Jesus is a benefit to us. Now, I want to remind you of everything that happened up to this point. There are many important details that it's easy to forget about because it happened a while ago. But I want you to rethink about the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, how the devil came out and tempted Jesus. Just worship me a little bit, Satan said, and I will give you all the world and you won't have to suffer and die. But Jesus rejected the temptation of Jesus, and he kept his focus on what God, his Father, had in store for him. Jesus also boasted that, destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. Jesus also proclaimed that he is the rock, the chief cornerstone. But those are just words until he puts it into action. And he's putting it into action right now by allowing himself to be crucified. He is denying the temptation of rejecting pain. Instead, he is faithful to his Father. He does not turn from suffering, but he accepts it so that we might be saved. Jesus allows his body, his temple, to be destroyed so that he may rebuild it again in three days, thus proving what he said earlier. Jesus is the rock, And even with his death, there is a great earthquake. And those rocks open up. The grave opens up. The gates of hell cannot stand against the power of Jesus when he comes. And so we see a little foretaste, a hint of what's to come. When those rocks are rolled away, when our rocks on our tomb are rolled away, and we also, God's holy ones, are able to rise up and walk around once more. But that, again, is a foretaste of what's to come. Jesus claimed to have the power of the king to be the holy temple, to be the chief priests. What does this all mean? He's claiming to have the power over life and death, the power to forgive sins itself and to bring people into God's presence. And on the cross, he proves those boasts. He is mighty to save. Satan, the accuser, has used sin and death to destroy us, God's chosen ones, God's children. Satan accuses us before the throne, saying that we're sinful. We're not good enough to be in God's presence. We're not good enough to be his image bearers. But Jesus came to fulfill the law. He took the curse of the law upon himself, thus fulfilling the law. So that when, G- when Satan accuses, Jesus can say, no, Satan, you are wrong. And then he takes the weapons of Satan. Since he's destroyed sin, Jesus can take death. And what was once used as a punishment to destroy us is used to destroy sin in our lives. Because Jesus fulfills the law. He is able to defeat Satan. And he's able to use the weapon of the enemy to, for our benefit. Now, isn't that a wonderful thought? We can think forward to the day when we will be perfect, when sin is no longer in our lives. Now, today we have just a little foretaste of that, a little down payment. God has given us the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, so that we can have the assurance and the comfort that he is working in our lives. 
and that we know that what God says and promises to us will be fulfilled. When we think about death, we don't have to be scared. Instead, we can be joyful because death is a tool that will put an end to our sinning. And the older I get, the more I see what a blessing that is. The older I get, the more I am convicted by my sin and how ashamed I am that I keep sinning. I keep thinking to myself, shouldn't I be over this by now? Shouldn't I be mature enough, wise enough, skilled enough to stop sinning? Well, if you're like me, brothers and sisters, I have good news. Jesus puts an end to our sinning. The very things in this world that were used to torture us instead will be for our benefit. By the death of Jesus, by his wounds, we are healed. We are granted forgiveness. We are granted eternal life. We are granted citizenship in God's kingdom. More than that, we are given the Holy Spirit so that we can call ourselves sons and daughters of God. Now this word of the Lord moves with power and it doesn't wait to get to work. It happens immediately. The act of God pouring out his wrath upon his son, is at the same time an act of God's immense mercy to us. God is both loving and just. He is merciful. Everything he does has to be loving. It has to be just. And so when it's required that God pours out his wrath, he is also going to act with mercy as well. This is what God spoke about through the prophets, that the time will come when the day of the Lord will come when God will put an end to sin, an end to death, and bring eternal life to his people. But it was going to come through blood. But that blood is good news because when Jesus fulfills the law, God is no longer limited to just the temple. Not, he's not going to limit himself to one place. He's going to move throughout the world, all of time, everywhere, to be with his children. This is symbolized when the curtain is torn open, It's as if God is leaving the temple and he's getting everything out of the way. Any obstacle in his path, whether it's a curtain or whether it's a stone on the tomb, everything is being broken open, cast aside. Nothing stands between us and God anymore. That is a beautiful thought. Indeed, this isn't just a promise for God's chosen ones, the people of Israel, but for all of God's chosen ones, even Gentiles. And we see right away, that that Roman centurion sees and proclaims that Jesus is the Son of God. Now I want to leave you with this challenge. Are you going to allow this Roman centurion, this pagan who crucified Jesus, to be a better witness to Jesus being the Son of God? Let that be a challenge for us today. Let us be a better witness to the world that Jesus Christ is Lord (laughs) let's not let this Roman centurion outshine us, shall we? And when we go out into the world, we know that we're going to face opposition. We know we're going to face resistance. We're going to be mocked and accused of being hateful when we start talking about Jesus. But let me remind you that the tools of the enemy Jesus uses for our benefit. This is what Paul talks about in Romans that everything works for our salvation for those who love the Lord. So the tools of the enemy is actually for our benefit. You know, when I was talking about tying my shoes, you know, if being a follower of Jesus was just as easy as tying our shoes, well, what kind of honor would that be to us? But when we go out and we face harsh opposition, when we face harsh trials, and in our faithfulness and obedience to Jesus... He is faithful and obedient to us, and he'll pull us through. And when we do so, we will receive God's glory and God's honor. But when we think about that great task, we might think that we're not up to it, that we're going to fall and crumble. And yes, we probably will. But praise God that his spirit in us will not fail, and we will be picked up again and again as often as it takes in order for God's purpose in our lives to be fulfilled. So brothers and sisters, walk with God's glory. He honors us with his presence. Let us acknowledge that presence each and every day. When we rise up in the morning, when we go to bed at night, when we're eating at our dinner table or we're out in the world doing our work, when we're talking with kids or strangers or whatever we're doing, let us acknowledge that 
that God is with us. And not even the gates of hell or the stones of the grave can stand between Jesus and us. He is coming for us, and his spirit is with us this very moment and every moment of every day. That is the power of the gospel for us to live faithful lives, bold and courageous lives in the world, free from sin and Satan, free from being fearful of all the pain in this world. So let us walk with faith, hope, and love. Let us walk with the full assurance that Jesus loves us, and his love for us makes us perfect. That is our comfort and our joy. May God be praised, both now and forevermore. Amen. May you join me in prayer. Faithful Jesus, I am so thankful that you were faithful to your Father and that you saved us. So pray, Lord Jesus, that as we look to you, that as we look to your hands and your feet and your side, when we see what you endured for us, that we will be contrite and humble, that we will repent and we will pick up our cross and follow you. So when we look to you, Lord Jesus, will you fill us with love and hope and faith? May your joy and gratitude overflow in our lives so that each and every day we can confess that you are king. In your name we pray. Amen. As a hymn of thanks and praise, we join me in singing number 386, The Comforter Has Come.
Brothers and sisters, the Comforter has come. And so since we have been comforted by God, let us go out and comfort others with the name of Jesus Christ. So as you go out with, go out with this blessing from the Lord, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn to you and give you peace. As we go out today, let us sing number 235, Take the Name of Jesus with you. <laughs>